In Canada's most western province, land and sea conspire to create a country pristine and wild, where rugged coastlines and ancient forests give way to world-class cities. We'll cruise from the southern to the northernmost reaches, to places where whales can be spotted in the mist. Whether it's a safe haven for seal pups, a garden short of Eden, high tea, or the high wire. In the next hour, we'll explore all the wonders of British Columbia from Vancouver and beyond. Our visit to British Columbia kicks off in Vancouver. British Columbia's biggest city and Canada's gateway to the Pacific is tucked away in the southwest corner of the country, near the United States border. In spite of its northern latitude, warm currents bring both a mild climate and rain. Some 44 inches annually fuel the surrounding forests. First and foremost, Vancouver is a seaport. And in a port town, water taxis, ferry boats, and seaplanes are the way to get around and take in the dramatic skyline. If you think this shining metropolis looks relatively new, it's because it was established in 1886. Around town, several landmarks offer a glimpse into the past our first stop, Gastown, in the heart of old Vancouver. At Maple Tree Square, a statue of a man on top of a keg marks the site where the city began when Gassy Jack Dayton opened his saloon in the 1860s. Jack and his Dayton House Hotel really became a landmark. He loved to talk. In fact, he talked the leg off almost everybody, including one of his wives who died, some say, because of his excessive talking. Gastown, named for Gassy Jack, is still a spot to blow off some steam. In fact, you can set your watch to the world's first steam-powered clock. This two-ton timekeeper shoots up clouds of steam every 15 minutes to the tune of an old-fashioned calliope. It's also a favorite backdrop for a photo op. Gastown was Vancouver's original town site, but the railroad put the city on the map. These tracks, located on the cobbled streets of Granville Island, once carried trains from the east coast of Canada all the way west. Today, a converted warehouse is home to the Granville Market and to a variety of vendors who hawk their wares. Since no big chain stores could do business here, it's just rows and rows of mom and pop operations. And it brims with the bounty of British Columbia. JJ Bean turns out the best cappuccino, whipping it into a shape to satisfy any Java junkie. Well, I think most people come here for the atmosphere and it's, uh, you know, there's great produce, uh, two or three bakeries and a lot of, a lot of small shops that, uh, it's just, just nice to come down and hang out and wander around. The number one donut dealer, Lee's, has been serving up freshly made donuts for the past 25 years. And that's the secret to their success. A lot of donuts are machine cut, ours are hand cut, and we just make them fresh every day. They're hot all throughout the day. And I think that's the number one thing that makes them so popular. Lees are a treat for all ages, but donuts aren't the only foods freshly baked on site. This morning I'm making a rice pudding. The specialty of this stand is one of many Asian flavors found in a city with the nickname Hongkouver. Here, East definitely meets West. Nearly one in five residents has a Chinese heritage, and the population is spread throughout Vancouver. 
Yet, the first immigrants came to work on the railroad. They were cheap labor. Some of them came directly from China. This was the same pattern that had been used in the States for building the railway. And it's said that there's probably one dead Chinese buried under every foot of the track through the mountains of British Columbia. And when the railway was finished, the Chinese came back to Vancouver, and Vancouver's Chinatown really started to grow. A trip to Chinatown is like stepping into the Far East. A series of small vendors set out exotic fare. And curio shops line the crowded streets. Chinatown is also home to the first full-scale Ming Dynasty garden ever built outside of China. Named for the founder of the Chinese Republic, the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Classical Chinese Garden was part of the 1986 World Expo. 52 experts from China brought over 1,000 crates of tiles and pebbles to create this serene space. The landscaping incorporates both the yin and the yang with the purpose of promoting urban peace and tranquility. Ties to the past also live on at one grand hotel. This Fairmont Hotel Vancouver opened to commemorate a royal visit. Well, we started off, of course, with the uh, visit of Queen Elizabeth and King George VI in 1939. And since then, um, we've hosted uh, the current royal family. We've hosted uh, presidents. The spacious lobby and adjoining piano bar recall the elegance of an earlier era. Thanks to a royal renovation to the tune of $70 million, this landmark features luxuriously spacious suites with sitting rooms and dining rooms. Tradition is also the calling card of the nearby Wedgwood Hotel. When guests check in, a lobby of antiques awaits them. Streetside, a casual lounge is a great place to unwind, where service is second to none. Terraces in this small boutique hotel lead to downtown views. For contemporary quarters, the sleek design of the Delta Vancouver Suites provides a state-of-the-art place to stay for 21st century travelers. And once again, east meets west. The hotel's restaurant, Manhattan, draws upon eclectic flavors of New York and the Far East. Vancouver's skyline is a mass of metal and glass, but one celebrated structure, the University of British Columbia's Museum of Anthropology, gives a glimpse into a native past. To cast these tall totems in a perfect light, architect Arthur Erickson created 75-foot windows. Totems were carved to commemorate important rites, events, and status. They might show what are known as crests or um, animal or human figures that might be adopted by particular individuals or families to represent themselves, like a tartan would be for someone from Scotland. And one of the ideas that people have about totem poles is that the, the most powerful figure sits at the top of the pole, but in fact the most powerful person is usually located at the bottom of the pole because he is supporting the weight of the others on his shoulders. The collection is also displayed behind the museum. These 19th century longhouses and totems built by the Haida, one of 30 First Nation tribes, reinforce the region's rich traditions. Traditions that continue with current works, like those of First Nation artist Robert Davidson. But Davidson's art isn't just for looking. You can eat it. Davidson drew upon native imagery of an eagle to create a medallion for chocolate arts, a local confectionery that pushes the art of chocolate to new lip-smacking levels. Behind the scenes, artisans are breaking the mold. The shop's owner, Greg Hook, is a former pastry chef and a confirmed chocoholic. He says the public's taste for finer chocolates has evolved. And like Vancouver itself, 
the chocolate has an international flavor. We have beans from Tanzania, from, from the Indian Ocean, from South America. Every one of the chocolates is extremely different in flavor. We are an artisanal chocolate shop, so just we, everything is handmade as opposed to made by machines. And so it's just the, the love that we put into making that with the high cocoa content chocolates just means that each of them has a lot better flavor. And if you feel the need to walk off the chocolate, Vancouver's first tourist attraction, the Capilano Suspension Bridge, is the highest and longest footbridge in the world. Erected in 1889, the original hemp and cedar planks have been replaced with steel cables. Although it sways with the weight of 800,000 annual visitors, it's strong enough to support two fully loaded 747 airplanes as the bridge spans 450 feet above the Capilano River Canyon. One popular saying describes British Columbia's premier city as the Pearl of the Pacific. And in this spectacular setting, everyone can enjoy the great outdoors. Well, Vancouver is a lifestyle city because uh, you have the ocean, you have the mountains, and you have the city all in one place. They all kind of merge together, and it's just a wonderful place to be. The jewel of Vancouver is Stanley Park. Situated just a few blocks from the hustle and bustle, this 1,000-acre oasis opened in 1888 on land originally set aside for the military. Taking it in is as easy as riding a bike or strapping on a pair of rollerblades and gliding along a paved promenade. There's even an oceanside saltwater swimming pool. And in English Bay, sunbathers dip in the cool waters of the Pacific. It's also a place to explore the mysteries of the deep. In the interior of the park, the multi-level Vancouver Aquarium gets you up close to over 600 species of marine life. From the most feared creatures of the sea to some of the friendliest. The Beluga Encounters program allows participants to create a few whale tales of their own as they come in contact with these incredible creatures of the Arctic. Called canaries of the sea, their sounds are more than social. They're used underwater to locate and herd prey. While spitting and spy hopping are considered normal behaviors, the belugas have learned a few tricks in captivity. And these natural born performers aren't the least bit shy. Vancouver's aquarium also acts as a marine mammal rescue center. Far away from the crowds, you'll find an ER unit for seal pups. People called us because they found them on beaches or on docks, various areas along the BC coast, and they felt that they were distressed in some way. They may have been injured, they may have been ill, they may have been orphaned or abandoned. Each pup is at a different level of risk and rehabilitation. An animal like Siren here, she's fat, she's healthy, she's weaned, eating fish on her own, and she's getting very close to release. She just needs to get a little bit stronger and a little bit fatter. As we progress down the line, you can tell um, with Cassandra here, she's a little bit younger. She's not as big as Siren is, she's not as fat as Siren is. So with her, it's really important, it's just like human baby. Premature animals, their immune systems may not be as well developed and we have to keep a really close eye on their health. And to grow, they need to eat. Inside the rescue center's kitchen, it's feeding time. The weakest pups are on a liquid diet. Staff members whisk up a thick concoction called a herring milkshake. This healthy blend of fish oils and vitamins is just what a young pup needs to build up blubber. The goal is to wean them to raw fish. Once they learn to hunt, they'll be released. And when it comes to baby seals, it's definitely hands off. We don't want to turn them into pets. And because they're wild animals, they really don't appreciate petting. It's not a comforting thing like it is with cats and dogs. As for the rate of success, 70 to 80% of the ER patients are eventually released back into the wilds. 
Heading north from Stanley Park, the link to land crosses another BC landmark. The Lions Gate Bridge connects Vancouver to the Sea to Sky Highway, a trip hailed as one of the world's most exquisite coastal drives. As you meander your way skyward above mountains that rise out of the sea, the sight of sheer granite cliffs are the first indication of why an area called Squamish holds bragging rights as BC's outdoor recreation capital. This is the destination of choice for those who seek vertical thrills. You can sort of match on it. Okay. You're going to be going out left. Yeah. And right under the fourth bolt, there's going to be like a tiny, tiny little scene. And Rock climbers see. plot out their routes then begin by threading their way up. It's the connection between the, the physical movement and the analytical thought, trying to plan your, your next move, as well as follow through by actually making your body do what you think you need to do. And it's climb at your own risk. A safety tether and a partner are the only things that separate a climber from a fatal fall. Squamish is more than a center for rock climbing. It's an Indian word for mother of the wind. Here, a narrow man-made dike, locals affectionately call the squish spit, acts as a launching pad. Oh, time to go play. Woo. One high-flying pastime gets you pumped. Using huge crescent-shaped kites with inflatable pockets, Kiteboarding at the spit is all about catching some air. It's a wind machine. It, it, what happens is, is the, the air in here, like where Whistler is to the north, it warms up, and the cool air on the Pacific stays cool. A thermal draw funnels the air through the cliffs to create a wind tunnel. A crash landing doesn't just undo your do. It's a frigid wake-up call. It can be very extreme or it can be very tame, depending on your ability and your ability to read the wind and to know the conditions. But it can be very dangerous. The steady stream of air draws hardcore enthusiasts from all over BC. Rob Mulder is a world windsurfing champion whose need for speed led him to develop his own board. It's only 18 and a half pounds, you know, for something this big. And, uh, you know, it's just really wide, short. You know, it, it planes up in very little wind. So in, in basically about eight knots of wind, 10 miles per hour wind, you can have a whole lot of fun. Where one erratic move will knock you off your feet, the pros know exactly how to play the wind. The wilderness of British Columbia offers something for every kind of outdoor adventurer. The Sea to Sky Highway leads to the town of Whistler, where one of the world's most famous ski resorts sits in the shadow of two giant mountains, its namesake Whistler and nearby Blackcomb. At 5,280 feet, Blackcomb Mountain boasts the greatest vertical ski drop in all of North America. And together, Blackcomb and Whistler host 200 ski trails across three glaciers, the largest number on the continent. All this, plus a setting where winter sports are almost year-round, makes for a great place to play. Regardless of the season, the day begins and ends in the village. When this town was designed, the blueprint called for a people-friendly place. Outdoor cafes lined the streets. And the stream of impromptu entertainment keeps things moving. Like the crowds who flock here, Whistler is relatively young. It was designed in the 60s with the hope of hosting the Olympics. In the year 2003, 
the dream of many decades became a reality. Now the 21st Olympic Winter Games in 2010. The whole town turned out for the announcement. Vancouver. Vancouver will host the games of the 2010 Winter Olympiad. And most of the snow-based events will be held in Whistler. That kind of excitement, the fact that especially in Whistler, we've got young kids who are already ski racers and in winter sport who could be on the podium at home in their hometown in 2010. And that doesn't happen very often. So it really brings dreams together as a community. Uh, and it's pretty amazing to share that vision with 10,000 people. In the meantime, Whistler continues to do what it does best. In this 365-day sports-oriented destination, mountain biking is second only to skiing in popularity. And at Whistler, it's no pedal in the park. Bikers don full body armor to tackle this extreme sport. Gondolas transport riders and their cycles up the mountain. The bike park stretches across 124 miles of marked trails. Veterans claim this drastic downhill drop is something you do from your gut. But for adrenaline junkies, biking isn't the only outdoor rush. Like much of British Columbia, this area is filled with scenic lakes and rivers. Whitewater rafting is one way to whirl by it all. Whistler River Adventures will bus you to the river's edge. It is a bit low now, but it's still pretty spicy. I mean, there's lots of rock showing, which means we have to be pretty accurate getting downstream. And once you get there, they'll provide everything you need. This is gonna go to the back of your head, okay? Like so on your head. From helmets. And on the count of three. To one, thick wetsuits. And even a primer on how to paddle. The first stroke we're gonna learn is a forward stroke. Paddle goes straight up and down into the water. You reach as far forward as you can and pull back. Use your stomach and back muscles if you can. Okay? They're big muscle groups. Full of dramatic drops, boulders, and Class 3 rapids, the rushing waters of the Green River take you on a thrill ride through the backwoods. This mostly untamed region can put you face to face with nature's wildest creatures. Whistler is the stomping ground for an estimated 120 black bears. Look at this. Look at the claw marks on here. Wow. Now these aren't this year's, they're not fresh. And uh, another one here. And with signs of bears everywhere, what do you do if you have a bear encounter of the close kind? Um, you're probably not going to see aggression, uh, but you might see what you interpret as aggressive or assertive behavior. The Whistler Bear Society promotes coexistence. Executive Director Sylvia Dolson feels you need to read their body language. If a bear, if you enter a bear's personal space, he's going to let you know, because he's going to be feeling really uncomfortable. And the way he's going to communicate that to you, because they really don't speak English or French, so they're going to have to talk to you with their body language and with different sounds. And one of the typical sounds that a bear would make is huffing. And it goes like this. And they might also pop their jaws. And they're simply trying to communicate to you that you're in my personal space and I want you to back off. While you keep your distance, keep your eyes on the bear to show who's boss. And remember, bears were here long before you were, and the Whistler Bear Society aims to keep the peace. In the old growth forest surrounding Whistler, you'll find a new high-flying adventure. Sit back into your harness, are you ready? Three, two, one, I got your feet off, you go.
when we first came up with the idea, there was definitely a little, you want to do what and you want to do why. And then we started trying to explain things. Well, you know how James Bond goes between buildings and trying to get that point across. And once we started to explain that it was a combination of an adventure tour with an educational component, then it started to really click with people. Zip tracking is designed to get your heart pumping. A series of platforms are the jump off points for a ride even Tarzan would be proud of. Take another step down for me. But you'll need more than a loincloth for this flight through the forest. Zip trackers in helmets and harnesses are hooked to five cables strung between Whistler and Blackcomb Mountains. And off you go. On this lightning fast ride, you zoom past 600 year old cedar trees. It's highly educational. It teaches people about sustainability. Hopefully people will leave inspired and hoping to reduce their ecological footprint on the planet. Truth be told, foresters have long used zip lines to get from tree to tree. But in Whistler, the general public can zip track. A high wire adventure that'll set you spinning. It doesn't take much to get to the backcountry. But to rise above it all, Black Comb helicopters will take you on an unforgettable ride to remote areas where alpine vistas spread out before you. This table for two on the glacier is reserved for an exclusive high altitude lunch. Set amid snow-capped peaks, it's no ordinary meal. Hella picnicking is among the most romantic of Hella adventures that include Hella proposals and Hella weddings. And if things don't happen to work out, we had a Heli divorce, believe it or not, two people that wanted to uh, celebrate uh, splitting up. Hella adventures opens up a world of possibilities. You can take an afternoon walk across an ancient glacier to a place few people ever see, where the only footprints and shadows cast will be your own. In a region shaped by the sea, with miles of tree-lined coasts and uninhabited islands, ferry boats carry commuters back and forth between the city of Vancouver and Vancouver Island. Our visit to the largest island off the west coast of North America begins in Victoria on the southern tip. The picturesque inner harbor is the heart of this, the capital of British Columbia, and the hub of activity for both locals and tourists. In a city that defines itself by all things British, Victoria gets its name for the long reigning monarch, Queen Victoria. Along the harbor, the BC Parliament, topped with 33 copper domes, was designed after the British Parliament. And to this day, Canada remains a member of the British Commonwealth. The Fairmont Empress Hotel, another landmark named for the Queen, has dominated the harbor ever since it opened its doors in 1908. Although Queen Victoria never set foot in her namesake city, the Empress has hosted many affairs of state over the years. The Posh Hotel recalls the Gilded Age, when the sun never set on the British Empire. Suites are formal, with a separate sitting room. And Victorian-era costume guides escort you through the regal common areas that include the Bengal Lounge, that was once a gentleman's reading room. Afternoon tea was first served in the Palm Court under the signature Tiffany glass dome ceiling. Today, guests carry on this ritual in the tea lobby. The Empress brews its own blend and serves it with all the trimmings. While the dress code is smart casual, the atmosphere's relaxed. All told, afternoon tea at the Empress is a cherished Victoria tradition. 
and there's still a lot more of the British Isles to be found outside. You can make a call from a red phone booth or get around on a double-decker bus. And as the saying goes, everything's cricket. This alternative to baseball and pastime of the English aristocracy dates back to the 12th century. After the game, pop into a pub for a quick pint of ale. Spinnaker's, the first brew pub in all of Canada, serves up beer with a pedigree. We're an English style brew pub. Um, the first brewer who came over was actually from England and he brought a lot of the passion that the English have for beer. And so we're, we've been lucky to carry on that tradition over the years. Also known as the city of gardens, the geography and climate here are ideal for anyone with a green thumb. Outside Victoria, one botanical wonder is in a class all by itself. Bouchard Gardens spread across 55 acres. These beautifully landscaped trees and flowers, connected by winding pathways, were the vision of Jenny Bouchard, the wife of an industrialist who chose this site to build a cement plant in 1904. He needed limestone, he needed fresh water, he needed transportation access and labor, and it all came together at this beautiful spot in Todd Inlet. So he moved his family out here, and while he was making a mess digging out the limestone, Jenny was creating a beautiful garden. A passion that began with a gift of a rose bush blossomed into gardens with roses from over 2,500 plants. Set amid a stream and flowing ponds, the Japanese garden was planned with the help of landscape architect Isaburo Kishida. That developed as Mr. Butchart was making the mess in what is now the sunken garden, and when he had uh, depleted the use of the limestone, this was in 1908, and a friend of Jenny said to her, Jenny, what a mess, I bet even you can't grow anything in this. And of course, that was, that was it. She started uh, trucking in tons of topsoil. Out of the devastation came a masterpiece. In the distance, a ruin from the cement plant is a reminder of what was once a wasteland. The sunken garden, Jenny Bouchard's grandest challenge, is one of her most amazing accomplishments. The Bouchard Gardens are said to be Canada's Garden of Eden. West of Victoria, near the town of Souk, lies a garden of another sort. Each day, the seaweed lady, Diane Bernard, scours the coastline looking for some 300 varieties of seaweed. Her bounty is used for body and bath products, and Diane has managed to convince some local chefs that it's a delicacy. We invited them out, and they came out into the low tide with me, and we started sampling and uh, eating the seaweeds. We would take it back into the kitchen, and they would start preparing it. There's four types here. There's a sea lettuce, alaria, porphyra, and agrigia. Master chef Edward Tucson has found many ways to savor seaweed at Souk Harbor House, a seaside inn famous for its food. You know, I think the thing is that people have to realize it's, it's a vegetable. You know, it, it's not like grossly salty. I mean, even if you eat it raw, I mean, it's, it's good. Well, it definitely complements the food because of the subtletiness of it, okay? Um, because it doesn't have an overwhelming flavor, it's not going to take control of a dish. So, I mean, it goes really well with seafood. Daring dishes have won awards for this restaurant that specializes in local ingredients. And it's not only seaweed that's on the menu. Edible flowers of all shapes and colors top off a dish that looks almost too good to eat. This is more or less a type of dish you, you would get at, at Sioux Harbor House. Um, you have flowers, you have seaweed, you know, you have the ocean and you have the garden. We end the day back in Victoria, along the terrace of the Empress Hotel. A champagne dinner is served at sunset, against the backdrop of the inner harbor. 
As dusk turns to night, the classic outline of Parliament lights up this most British of Canadian cities. In the vast and untamed land of British Columbia, Vancouver Island stretches across 300 miles. Yet much of the west side is not accessible by road. Leaving the capital city of Victoria and heading to the west coast, the country becomes more rugged and remote. Here, West Coast Wild Adventure float planes are the means to a bird's eye view as pilot Louis Rouleau takes you on a tour. There's an incredible diversity on Vancouver Island. You're, you're flying along the shorelines. There's a, the huge Pacific waves are just crashing on the, on the rocky you know, points and everything. You can see the big swells coming in. There's a lot of sea lions, whales. You know, it's an amazing way to see the whales because you'll actually see them under the water. Turning inland toward the central region of the island, the jagged peaks of the Sawtooth Mountains come into view. Melting snow from the glaciers feed a land of high altitude lakes and Della Falls. With a vertical drop of over 1,400 feet, it's the tallest waterfall in Canada. These waters eventually make it down to sea level. If you want to spend the night out in the BC wilds, around an isolated cove of the Barclay Sound, the Eagle Nook Wilderness Resort and Spa is a sophisticated shelter in the middle of nowhere. Reachable by boat or float plane, this exclusive retreat from civilization has only 25 rooms and cabins. With a waterfront view, it's the perfect spot to relax. And this rustic Shangri-La even has a spa. You don't have to look too hard to find the resort's namesake. The property borders an area where bald eagles flock year after year. Belonging to the family of sea eagles, these birds of prey eat a lot of fish, snatching them from the surface with their talons. The waters are also a haven for anglers. Salmon is king in these parts, and fish are jumping. There are a half a dozen varieties to reel in. Back at the resort, the catch of the day is weighed. They'll even wrap it up for shipping. Or you can have yours roasted over an open flame for a feast in the great outdoors. Off the west coast, the Broken Group Islands, a collection of over 300 islands and inlets, act as a protective barrier. Sea kayakers seek out these calmer waters. The BC coast is also a gathering ground for several species of whales. At the seaside port of Tofino, daily tours will suit you up to stay warm and take you whale watching. And it's usually about 30 seconds or so for another few breaths before they head back down, just like that. Just right up right there. Guides are well versed on the whereabouts of these giants, so the odds of spotting one are pretty good. For a step back in time, First Nation Echo Tours takes visitors to an island rainforest in a hand-carved canoe once used for hunting seal. And on this trip, everybody picks up a paddle. A hike through a rainforest can be amazing. The trees are a testament to nature at its richest. And it's not just the size of the massive trunks that'll astound you, but the fact that many are over 1,000 years old. I think one of the things people really need to see when they visit Vancouver Island are the rainforests that surround our island. Uh, they're unique to this part of the world and they're magical places and a place to renew your spirit and just enjoy the abundance of nature. While some backcountry treks are moderate, 
one trail is a challenge to even the most physically fit. Spanning 47 miles along treacherous terrain, the West Coast Trail through the Pacific Rim National Park was created in 1906 to rescue stranded sailors when ships ran aground. What makes the going so rough? Try slogging through the endless mud called pits of despair. A series of boardwalks provide some relief, but fatigue and tree roots can trip you up. And at times when you're soaking wet and cold, you're gonna be wondering, why am I doing this? And then at the end of the day, you look out in the ocean and the waves rolling in, it just it calms you down and you realize that this is why I'm here and why I'm doing it. As groves of old growth trees give way to miles and miles of beautiful beaches, an area called Long Beach has become a hot spot for hanging tent. Riding waves is a sport that's long been dominated by beach boys. But the Surf Sisters are turning the tide. So center of gravity nice and low, knees bent, hands out, face looking forward. Who's cool now? We are. All right. Okay, so let's Surf Sisters is the only female-run surfing school in Canada. Chrissy Montgomery and Tia Holmes will teach you how to catch a wave like a pro. We do a bunch of different uh, camps out here, um, teen camps, uh, mother-daughter camps. Uh, that's great. I mean, what a better way to bond with your mom than go yeah. shred the gnar with her, you know? <laughs> and then uh, there's also yoga surf retreats. Their philosophy is to build skills before hitting the surf. So they begin with the basics on dry land. It's at our feet now. Are we in the wave? No. Not yet. We gotta take an extra three strokes. So one, two, three strokes. Prepare. And up. What you're doing is in one swift motion, you're going from lying on your belly on your board to popping up to your feet. You don't want to drag a knee. That's why we teach them popping up in the sand first so they can get up right to their feet without having a knee touch the board. If you do fall off your board, what are you gonna do? Grab your Grab head. head. It's the most important rule. Where the rip currents can be dangerous, the Surf Sisters spotlight safety along with a few tricks. If you want to hang 10, you're going to walk to the end. This is just hanging five. I got five toes off the nose. But one more step, and I got 10 toes right off the nose like this. Then you're hanging 10. All right. And the surfing music comes in. And for this duo, the ultimate reward is something simple. Definitely seeing them stand up for the first time. With yeah. the stand up face, this one. Oh my god. Because oh <laughs> it's so much fun. Almost every time I teach a lesson, the next day I'm out there again, I see the people I taught yesterday with rental gear surfing. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, hey, yeah, thanks. We love it. And they're yeah. super addicted. We, yeah. we need to write something on the waiver that's like warning. Yeah. Extremely <laughs> addictive. Heading north from the city of Vancouver. The rugged coast of British Columbia stretches all the way to the Alaskan border. Here, a series of islands and narrow winding channels form a protective barrier called the Inside Passage. The highway becomes a ferry boat, as much of the country is only accessible by sea. One of the best ways to soak in the scenery is aboard the Empress of the North. The Empress is the first paddle wheel to be built to be used on the Inside Passage in almost 100 years. It follows a uh, tradition, if you will, of the paddle wheelers going up and down the Inside Passage all the way up to Skagway and to Juneau uh, that began with John Muir. The ship has Victorian touches with red, white, and blue bunting, but it's no rusty old antique. Zero nine zero. Right, zero nine zero. While the stern wheel propels the ship forward, Z drives provide auxiliary power and speed. In the pilot house of the Empress, everything is state of the art. And on board, you won't be roughing it. Amenities include suites with private verandas and four levels of decks for sightseeing from every vantage point. With plenty of room to relax Oceanside. Heading north, the Empress crosses the Seymour Narrows. Today, it's an uneventful passage, but at one time, Ripple Rock 
a ragged twin peak lying just beneath the surface caused enough turbulence to sink 119 ships until 1958. They uh, dug vertical tunnels down on either side of the uh, of Seymour Narrows and then tunneled horizontally underneath Ripple Rock. Over 1,200 tons of dynamite was packed into the pair of tunnels. And when ignited, it set off the world's largest non-atomic peacetime blast. Now, it's smooth sailing. Cruising along at a respectable speed of about 15 miles an hour. At Johnstone Strait, the boat slows down to whale watch in the primary feeding grounds for orca whales. Over there. Over there. Orcas, better known as killer whales, are the biggest predators in these waters. They hunt and travel in groups called pods. Apart from humans, who are the most fascinated by them, orcas are the most widespread mammal in the world. The Empress's small size, just 360 feet from bow to stern, allows the ship to get dramatically close to the rugged coastline and to slow down when wildlife is spotted. Along the shores, harbor seals and sea lions haul out in mass for a rest period. Lying side by side, they growl and snarl over territory. Streamlined for swimming, their bottom-heavy shape makes getting around on land somewhat of a chore. Portside on the Empress of the North, dolphins tag along just for fun. And passengers ooh and ah over the excitement of seeing 40-foot humpback whales leap out of the ocean, slap the surface with their tails, and frolic in these calmer waters. British Columbia mixes the call of the wild with big city charm. From Victoria, where all hail Britannia, to the modern metropolis of Vancouver, and Whistler, where extreme sports are the norm. There's a plethora of, of outdoor recreational activities that are all right here at your doorstep. I've had days where I've skied in the morning, done a rafting trip in the afternoon, and then gone climbing at night, and never had to drive more than 10 minutes. Clean sands, uh, nothing like crystal clear water. Uh, you've got nature all over the place. You've got the ocean nearby, you've got the mountains here and the lakes, and it, people just are relaxed. You can't help but uh, be relaxed in a place like this. In this land of majestic mountain ranges, alpine lakes, and rocky seashores, we'll chase the last rays of the sun to the edge of the wilderness that makes British Columbia a remarkable part of the world. <laughs>